Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all so much for attending this virtual event today. My name is Holly Nyseth Brain, and I'm an associate professor Holly, in sociology at Ohio State, uh, as well as one of the co leaders of the Recovering from Violence cluster at Mershon. This next panel, which is scheduled for the next 50 minutes, is going to consider covering some of the impacts of 9-11, specifically on peoples and institutions uh, with an eye toward recovery. We have five fantastic panelists. Each will be speaking for 10 minutes. So as you can see, that will already take us to our 50 minute period of time. And because of that, I'm going to be putting their bios in the chat for you to check out while they're talking rather than reading them for you all, just to make sure they have as much time as possible. So to kick us off and get things started, I would like to welcome Dr. Matthew W. Gore, who's going to be speaking about the long-term health impacts from World Trade Center dust exposure. Thank you, Dr. Gore. Hi. Yeah, sorry. I was, as soon as I share my screen, the, uh, anyway, yeah, thank you, uh, Holly, for, for having me uh, today. I'm really excited to, uh, to kind of detail what's going on in, in our laboratory. Um, we've uh, been studying how air pollution affects the cardiovascular system and the pulmonary system for nearly a decade now. And, and on campus, we're studying, uh, we're continuing to, to study that as well as other sort of public health things such as vaping and and uh, so this seemed to be a natural collaboration for us uh, when we were approached by someone at NYU to, uh, to study how uh, the World Trade Center dust uh, can affect long-term health. And as many of you know, uh, and I, I put this slide here just to overwhelm you with uh, uh, the amount of research that's been done for the last two decades now on uh, the long-term effects of, uh, of um, exposure to the to the dust that accounted in, uh, on the World Trade Center disaster. We, uh, everything from cancer, there's been many uh, cancers associated with how long a first responder or someone's been exposed to the dust, uh, especially prostate cancer, to other things that, that go along with being part of a disaster like uh, PTSD, depression, uh, and, and now we're, we're finding cognitive impairment. And along with these is a is uh, a number of different respiratory diseases. And, and there's a, a registry uh, for first responders and others exposed at, at the time that that's, has thousands of people. And we're able to follow up uh, and uh, sort of correlate these, these problems with and measure their lung function and, and see that these things are actually uh, years after the disaster are still causing health issues. And in fact, that they're, they're beginning to worsen as that population ages. As you can imagine, uh, there is just an enormous amount of dust, uh, and we've seen the images um, of a, you know giant clouds. You've seen pictures from uh, from space of just a cloud over New York City at the time. And this top picture was taken on the 13th. And I hope you can appreciate the trees on the right side. It looks like uh, it was snowing. Um, you know, there's just an enormous amount of dust. The bottom picture was actually taken on the inside of an apartment nearby. Uh, so even uh, in, uh, it, it, we still have exposure to residents who are inside of, of an enormous amount of dust. And um, we, we, there's been quite a lot of characterization of what's in this dust. This is from 2002. They found a, a, a lot of lead, soot, calcium carbonate is a big component, as well as glass, asbestos. And you can see the, um, the elements on the right. There's a lot of different metals that are contained in this, as well as, uh, as PCBs that have, uh, you know, just way above what you would want to be inhaling. Um, so th this is a com complex mixture of so many different things that there's not just one thing that, you know, we're able to understand how it's affecting the, the pathology of those exposed. Um, this is a picture I took yesterday um, that we're, we're able to actually, we still have the dust uh, from our collaborator at NYU and um, we're able to use this to study how it's affecting um, a health long term, and the way that we do that um, here in, uh, is, is to utilize actually a, a rat model. And um, where the nice thing about rats is that they don't live very long, a couple of years. So long term exposure for them is, is just a few months. So what we did in the I'll share a little bit of data with you um, and hope to contribute to some discussion with this is is uh, we have we have them inhale the, the dust uh, to what we believe is about the same amount that a first responder spending a couple days uh, uh, in the area would would have inhaled. And then we wait a few months because we're now interested. This is now 20 years. So we're now interested in, in how um, 
how these things are affecting, you know, the long, what are the long-term implications of just a, a one exposure? And then we're able to measure the physiology of these rats uh, specifically in their heart and lungs. And, and um, this is David who um, is in front of our apparatus that measures lung function. I don't have an animal on there, uh, be on the bottom left, but it's, this is the same sort of lung data that we collect in humans. Uh, it's, we're able to collect this in rats exposed and, and, compare, uh, and compare the function. Looking at that, we do see very similar changes. This is after several months uh, that the rats uh, who were exposed to dust have decreased lung elastance, which uh, is a measure of just the flexibility of, of the lungs. And you want your lungs to be flexible when you breathe in and out. Uh, so that, that's reduced, and again, months later. So a large uh, part of a rat's life, uh, it, we still have uh, those effects. This is looking at how the lungs look in a microscope. On the left is what a normal lung looks like. These are the alveoli or, or the sacs that fill with air. Uh, you can see there's there's numerous uh, 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 sort of a health. That's what a healthy lung looks like on your left. And then uh, uh, they sort of die out and, and they get larger. And there's a lot of problems when uh, these rats are exposed to, to dust similar to what the first responders are getting. We also look at the heart. Uh, the, the heart and lungs are intimately related. And uh, this allows us to, uh, to this is a, um, uh, same machine that you'd use to examine a human is echocardiography. And these, these rats have uh, altered heart function months later. So we're still following them up now. We, I have actually next week, I'm looking at some nine months later, that's most of a rat's life. <laughs> uh, so um, we're continuing to follow, follow them up and uh, see what's going on. But most importantly is we're, we're able to actually look at the tissue of these animals and examine mechanistically, that is what, what are the, what are the, what, what is causing these changes? Uh, and that can help us in the future with, you know, determining is there some sort of change in therapy for these patients, uh, uh, for the first responders, you know, that, that we should be uh, worried about. And here you see there's some genes that are changed in their lungs as well as their heart. I won't go into detail, but this is a, the reactive oxygen species handling is, is affected in the, in the heart and lungs of these animals. Uh, and this, again, is something that you might expect to see right after exposure, but this is months later. After the, the body's been given the chance to uh, undergo reparative processes, uh, we still see uh, changes that are uh, pathological. Uh, and then I'll, I'll just sort of end with a few remaining questions, and this is why we're doing this. This is, this is funded by the CDC and the NIH, and um, first responders and others involved are now encountering age-related diseases, namely, you know, cardiovascular dysfunction, heart disease, how will these diseases be exacerbated by these long-term effects of, of dust inhalation? And then the dust itself is made up of a number of unique components. And the question remains for how does this alter the treatment strategies for those exposed? We hope that the data that we're using, uh, or the reason the rats to, you know, uh, to obtain uh, would help us to uh, answer that question. And this leads to a larger sort of uh, thought is that this was a 9-11 was also a, an environmental disaster that was really unmitigated. Uh, um, in the beginning of this uh, uh, seminar, uh, there was a video of Rudy Giuliani, I, Giuliani, I think, uh, saying, put, put on your mask, put on your mask. And, and you know, there's people walking with them with a mask on. And, and how, what measures can we um, be put in place for prevention? So that's kind of a larger question is, is that um, it seems that these are having effects on, on uh, thousands of first responders 20 years later. Uh, so how can we prevent that? I uh, uh, just, just want to thank those involved here with a quick slide. And, and this, this is, again, funded by um, uh, the NIH as well as the, the CDC. So I uh, hope to uh, have some uh, good publications on this uh, in, the, in the near future. But thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Gore. Uh, our next speaker is also going to be considering health, but we'll specifically be looking at behavioral health as well as psychosocial well-being. So I'm really pleased that we have Dr. Mona Ammer joining us from American University in Cairo, and her presentation is entitled On Risk and Resilience, Reverberations of 9-11 on American Muslim and Arab Communities Today. Thank you all. It's a, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk a bit about 
the experiences of the Muslim and Arab communities in the US and what has happened sort of over the past couple of decades. As, but you know, when we first start, I just wanna make it very clear just in case there's some misconceptions that the majority of Muslim Americans are not Arab and the majority of Arab Americans are not Muslim. These are two very different populations. Uh, Muslim Americans, although we don't have clear statistics over the overall population, we do know that Arabs probably account for about 20% and larger groups are African American, white or European American, Asian Americans. These are, you know, larger groups that account for the Muslim population. Meanwhile, when we talk about Arab Americans, the majority of Arab Americans historically have been Christian. It's only in recent years that we've had a shift in the percentage because of the recent influx of um, refugees after certain uh, uh, conflicts. So this is really important to, to know that these are two very distinct and different populations. Um, now, the one thing that do does bring them together, other than the fact that they're constantly being conflated in the public messaging, is that there is a paradox between the extent to which these groups are quite visible publicly, media, political rhetoric, et cetera, and invisible in research it's you know because we have federal guidelines against you know collecting you know including uh, religion on demographic forms and arabs in the united states are classified as white caucasian so i mean you can take a look at my face you can see i'm not white but that's the category i belong to so it's very hard to collect information and, and develop research to figure out what's going on with these communities but one thing that we can see that both of these communities have been facing um, is, a, is a constant and recurring and ongoing hostile environment. There's this you know, misperception that post 9-11, there was a backlash against Muslims and Arabs, and now it's gotten better. That's absolutely not true. From the time of the Patriot Act post 9-11 to Donald Trump's Muslim ban, there have been numerous institutional or structural policies aimed at reducing the influx of Muslims and Arabs to the United States, and then monitoring surveillance, um, deportations, detentions, and general erosion of civil liberties. We also have an increase in Islamophobia. And, you know, Islamophobia is not like an accident. It's not, a, 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 you know, people just misunderstanding. There is an orchestrated network of nearly 60 billion uh, worth, um, including funders and organizations and who are working towards trying to spread misinformation and propaganda against Muslims and vilifying Islam. And all of that, of course, impacts local organizational discrimination, everything from housing to employment to schools to local governments that are banning the building of mosques and um, an interpersonal discrimination, like relational aspects, like bullying for children or, um, you know, uh, you know uh, discrimination from neighbors. So overall, the environment is, is quite hostile and continues to be against these groups. Now, I'm not going to talk any more about Muslim Americans because they are the most ethnically diverse faith group of all faith groups in the United States. And it, it's kind of absurd to think that we can even say anything generalized against, you know, about these, this, this group. But I will continue now to talk a little bit about Arab Americans so you can get a better flavor about this specific ethnic group, about the experiences they've faced. So all of the different stressors that we've talked about have contributed to long-term impacts on their health and well-being, from identity development issues. I mean, if I'm a teenager and I'm and and how, how am I supposed to figure out who I am when the media or society or my friends around me are telling me that I am a bad person because of my ethnicity? Um, we have mental health issues. My own research about four years post 9/11 um, found higher rates of anxiety and depression in Arab Americans com in community samples compared to samples of Native American, Asian, American, Latino, African American communities. Um, and recent study, uh, so, and so this is continuing and research also showing higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder, et cetera. Uh, we also know from a lot of literature that discrimination has a physical impact. It, it, has, it causes wear and tear on the, on the body, leading to health disparities for groups that face constant discrimination like African Americans, and Arab Americans um, in terms of the um, higher rates of chronic uh, medical health conditions. As I mentioned, social issues in terms of relations, uh, relationships, feeling ostracized or feeling like you know, disengaged, 
community issues, both pockets of Arab American communities trying to sort of find their way within the landscape of their surrounding communities and that tension. And even within the Arab community, tension and political infighting over how do we respond to these external stressors? What should we do about it? And then of course we know that, you know, discrimination in general and prejudice has long-term impacts on socioeconomic um, well-being and, you know, education, income, um, et cetera. If you wanna know a little bit more, have a, a better feel about the sort of the experiences of Arab Americans, you can um, take a closer look at um, a model that we have developed that was published in the American Psychologist um, in 2019. And it kind of looks at sort of the macro level or the ecological contextual factors that are impacting um, Arab Americans and contributing to cumulative racial and ethnic trauma, starting from trauma histor historical from the homeland, like conflict or violence and immigration trauma or refugee trauma, um, to the current national context, as I discussed, and then um, and, and, and discrimination. And then at the micro level or individual, how people face interpersonal uh, discrimination and questions about identity and recognition and you know who am you know, who am i in a, in a country where you know i i'm not even represented in the basic demo i can't check a form that says arab or middle eastern i don't exist so those kinds of factors and then how that impacts the outcomes um also at the group level um we have uh, depending on the intensity of these factors the the factors that contribute to trauma we have different levels of uh, belonging versus feeling alienated, opportunities that are captured versus disadvantages, um, freedoms versus restrictions, like I said, monitoring or surveillance. And as I mentioned, the impacts on the individual level, um, physical, mental, hopelessness, alienation. Now, it's not all trauma. And you know, the, usually these presentations end with the last slide. I mean, really, that's it. You know, the, I'm a psychologist, so we often look at deficits and trauma and, and problems. But the fact is, there's a lot of shifts in the Arab American communities over the past couple of decades, which really show the, the resilience, the strengths, and the, and, and the movement towards empowerment of these communities. Um, um, there's a great deal of effort towards advocacy, um, activism, political and otherwise major effort to mobilize to be recognized in the US Census in 2020, but unfortunately that did not um, go through. Uh, coalitions, participation in movements like Black Lives Matters and other um, uh, Black Lives Matter and other types of movements, uh, efforts towards um, you know trying to access trying to fight for civil, civil liberties. We also have efforts for civic engagement like the Yellow Vote, Arab American Foundations, campaign to increase Arab American representation in um, elections, and also civic service, philanthropy, volunteerism, people contributing to their local communities. We also see a you know, larger increase of progr formal programs, institutions, nonprofit associations aimed at trying to address the issues that the Arab American community is facing, whether the issues relate to social or legal issues, um, helping people acculturate, for, like for immigrants. I, I should point out that the majority of Arab Americans um, are US citizens or you know, uh, permanent residents, and that um, a high percentage are second and later generation. They are not immigrants, but still immigrants need support. Um, and then things like youth development, healthcare services, et cetera. And then finally, um, the past couple of decades has seen a really flourishing um, of cultural activities, more and more, you know, fiction and other forms of literature, music, comedy, um, and, and we have cultural festivals, open houses, other events trying to sort of engage local communities um, with the Arab American communities. And of course, the establishment of the Arab American National Museum in 2005, um, which is the Smithsonian Institute, which also sort of worked to capture and you know, disseminate and, you know, kind of share the, the heritage of um, the Arab American community in the United States. So all of these things, I think, are positive signs of what is happening. And I think it's, you know, it, it, you know, that Arab Americans did not just receive the stress and the trauma and the discrimination, and particularly Muslim Arab Americans who face, of course, more of that than the Christian Arab Americans. Um, but I think that the past couple of decades has 
led to um, more opportunities for Arab Americans to find and, and share their voice. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Ammer. As we're seeing, the impacts of 9-11 are so multifaceted and varied, and I think we could spend a day really on any of these topics. Uh, and instead, of course, we are aiming for breath, and we're doing quick 10-minute primers. So with that, I'm going to move on to our next speaker, Dr. Nicholas Kaman. He actually just returned from responding to Hurricane Ida, and today you'll be talking with us about 9-11's lessons for disaster communication. Thank you very much for having me. And um, Holly, your last point is, is very relevant, I think, to disaster response as it uh, pertains to 9-11. I think um, our whole world as disaster responders changed you know, on that day. So I'll try to reflect a little bit on disaster response as a whole, because I don't know that you can talk about how people communicate in disasters uh, without discussing that. So. I know earlier today there was a panel on um, personal stories. I was a second year medical student over at Miling Hall when um, we were uh, notified that there were planes that had hit buildings in, um, in New York. And I think it had something to do with what I wanted to be as a physician, as an emergency physician and a disaster responder. And um, you know, I was I was a resident at Wake Forest when Hurricane Katrina happened, and interestingly, I was at Hurricane Ida last week, and and to the same day that Hurricane Katrina made landfall, uh, Ida made landfall in New Orleans. And spending three days in New Orleans, one thing that I can reflect on is the impact that Katrina had on New Orleans. We didn't see the levees fail. Um, we didn't see as much damage. You know, they, of course, lost some of their infrastructure. Um, but we've learned lessons in disaster response from each of these events that, is, that have happened. And, you know, I've been fortunate enough to write a few articles on this on disaster communication. Uh, we, we've written a couple papers on disaster apps for responders. And I'll kind of discuss that a little bit um, during the course of the talk. But like I said, um, you know, fortunately in disaster response, we learn from uh, things that have happened. And 9-11 and the anthrax attacks that happened in October of 2001, I think impacted a lot of how we do disaster response. And um, one of the big things that happened after that was the um, Congress funding the public health and emergency preparedness program, because a lot of other programs kind of spawn out of that. And as different programs would, would come to be, um, different ways to communicate would also uh, come to be. And I think um, for those of us that have been active in the pandemic response, I think a lot of our stance on COVID was impacted by H1N1. So. Um, you know, I can remember being early in my career at Ohio State when H1N1 happened in 2009, and some of the disaster caches and the ways that we've responded to COVID um, were certainly impacted by um, pandemic influenza. 2002, the year after 9-11, um, uh, the Public Health Emergency Preparedness um, Order allowed us to do a lot more with disease surveillance, public health laboratories and communication. And it also allowed us to set up disaster caches that you know, became integral to our COVID response. As far as disease surveillance, uh, some of you may not know that Columbus is a biowatch city. So we have a surveillance system within Columbus that looks for things like anthrax and tularemia. And that'll be very active, I think, tomorrow as we have a mass uh, gathering event here on campus. Um, so one of the things that also happened in 2002 is the Department of Homeland Security spun up and the other organizations got, um, you know, brought in under that umbrella. And one of the organizations that I work for is the Federal Emergency Management Organization. And one of the interesting things about FEMA is, and, and our team responded to 9-11 and actually I've responded to, to Hurricane Harvey, Laura, and other um, you know, incidents with people that were at 9-11 and, and really have been enthralled by hearing their 
uh, stories of, of searching through the rubble for uh, victims. But after 9-11, um, the FEMA took under um, weapons of mass destruction. So a lot of the, the training that I got when I joined our FEMA team uh, had a lot to do with responding to uh, weapons of mass, mass destructions, things like nerve agents and anthrax and bio agents and other things. But when it comes to communication, I think that we learned a lot from that day. So one of the things that um, you know, I think is has been publicized in, as we debrief from 9-11 is that the communications that happened that day were fraught with um, issues. And we tend to see communication break down in disasters, but um, the communication the Emergency Operations Center for the city of New York City was actually in World Trade Center 7. And one of the vital communications link was a radio repeater that uh, FDNY and FD uh, and the, the police group were gonna use that day. And that communications uh, radio router was lost. And we still use radios in disaster response. This is a, a picture of myself and Dan Bachman, one of my partners at Hurricane Laura last year. Uh, but we also use cell service um, pretty readily. And you know, when we respond to disasters, you know, this is a picture from a, a cell truck at Hurricane Laura. Um, we want re redundancy in our response. So if our radios are unable to communicate like they were uh, in 9-11, then we can go to another system. And unfortunately that day, police was on a different radio frequency than fire and fire's radio was saying, go up and um, you know, help evacuate the victims. And police's radio frequency was saying, get the heck out of there, the buildings are about to collapse. And unfortunately there wasn't congruency there. One of the things that I found um, really helpful is uh, from, after 9-11, uh, we realized that we needed better cell service for disaster responders. So in 2012, uh, the first responder network authority uh, was created and spun out of that was FirstNet. And I'm on FirstNet. Uh, I can tell you that in New Orleans, I had zero cell service the day after the hurricane, uh, but it was restored to FirstNet um, later in, in that day, which was a Monday. Um, and Verizon's actually coming out with a, a cell service for first responders as well. So how do we communicate in disasters? Well, we use radios and we tend to use uh, satellite phones. We use Wi-Fi when we can. Um, but a lot of times we'll use regular apps that are, are available commercially. So, um, you know, on, on the left hand side of your screen is a, a view of our communication for Hurricane Harvey. Uh, we used WhatsApp, we used a closed channel with uh, medical providers. And um, in the middle is uh, a chat from last week uh, that we were using in Livingston Parish, which is east of Baton Rouge. Um, and this is just a great way, um, you see the, the number 206 on there. A 206 is a form that um, medical providers have to fill out so we know where to take the dogs, where the nearest hospitals are, the nearest trauma centers. And we have to fill it out every day to make sure that we're you know, able to provide care um, to our responders. And the other thing that's become really interesting uh, with disaster response is the idea of crowdsourcing. So um, you guys may drive to work and use the Waze app and your trip, your commute into campus is impacted by what other people see. And FEMA has an app that involves um, a social response as well. Now, I can tell you that social media is both good and bad when it comes to disaster response. Um, you know, sometimes I feel like we get sent on wild goose chases based on somebody posting something on social media that they're entrapped in an attic or they have a loved one whose house is flooded. Um, but it's a part of what we do now when it comes to disaster response. And the FEMA app does have a social kind of crowdsourcing component to it. Um, regionally, we've gotten much better at communication. So, you know, just to, to show you this slide, it's from a, a presentation that we gave yesterday on COVID. And in our region, 
um, which is region four, we collaborate on how we're responding to COVID. And there was a piece on NPR just two days ago about citywide ambulance diversion to the emergency department. Our, our emergency department traffic is really coordinated by Central Ohio Trauma System. And this spun directly out of 9-11. Uh, the COTS Hospital Incident Liaison dictates where people go within the region. And we saw this on campus. So as I wrap up here with a couple seconds to go, we had a mass casualty incident on campus. It could have been much worse. Um, but when I think about communication that day, I think about redundancy. So um, if you followed Twitter, uh, OSU Emergency Man Management, there was a tweet that said, active shooter on campus, run, hide, fight, Watts Hall, 19th and College. It's a perfect tweet. If you're a responder, go there. If you're a student or a faculty member, get the heck out. And we also got a Buckeye alert that was similar that day. So if you weren't able to access social media, um, you were able to use your cell phone to get that alert. And these are all things that I think spun out of the communication breakdown that we saw on 9-11. So I'll wrap up and I'll put my email address in the um, chat if anyone has other questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaman. And thank you everyone for these amazing presentations all within 10 minutes. That's, that's truly phenomenal. So moving right along then, our next presenter is Dr. Laura Dugan. And the title of her presentation is Changes in U.S. Counterterrorism and Its Impacts. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I also have slides that I'll be sharing. Um, I had... Um, Asked to can can you see the actual um, the the presentation view at this point? No, okay. Neither can I. Okay, no, I do. Thank you. <laughs> um, so so I was initially asked to talk about changes in counterterrorism in general, and I wanted to also include its impacts because um, my research has persistently shown that that. Um, what governments do in, in response to terrorism or, or in reaction to potential terrorism matters in, in a lot of different ways. And so um, I want to start off by just showing this slide, this graph that shows um, the, the bold line is our number of terrorist attacks in the United States um, gleaned from the Global Terrorism Database. And the dashed line shows the frequency of um, US presidential communications that mention the word terrorism. Um, and so what you can see here, even though it, it predates 9-11, I think it's pretty important to look at, um, if, if we're gonna talk about changes, we wanna talk, look at and see what happened prior to 9-11, um, that, that the word terrorism wasn't really used a, a lot in frequency until the Bill Clinton administration. And during the Clinton administration, um, he, he actually, um, departed from earlier administrations, Ronald Reagan was the first to, to refer to a war on terror, which justified a military approach, as we heard from the, the um, presenters earlier today. And um, Bill Clinton tried to take a more of a preventive approach. And he, he also was engaged a lot with the academic community in order to, to try to find other sorts of solutions to this. However, um, I want to point out that there, the spike that occurred in um, communications relevant to terrorism is right after the Oklahoma City bombings. And so, so um, terrorism was definitely a lot more talked about um, than it had been previously because it was more salient. The um, bombings in the bombing in Oklahoma City was the largest attack on US soil um, to that date. And so, um, but, but what had happened is as the Clinton administration was coming to an end, the rhetoric started changing more toward um, the war on terror, um, using more of a military approach because of the terrorist that, was, that were starting to happen overseas. Now, um, obviously we see a huge spike right after 9-11 and, 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 um, and, and we know what the rhetoric of that was from the earlier speakers today, that this melodramatic, um, Argue, you know, the melodramatic response to the war on terror. And then, then we see that Obama and the Trump, the period of time that we um, collected for Donald Trump, um, went down to about the levels of Bill Clinton. So um, 
the immediate response, now this is, is really review for um, what we've seen um, or what we heard earlier today. Um, the immediate response to 9-11 was, was very dramatic, um, melodramatic, but also dramatic in that we changed the way that we do things. Um, it, it was a definite military approach to, to revenge for what had happened. We created the Department of Homeland Security as a way to centralize the response um, at home. Um, so we wanted to enhance investigative abilities. Um, the intelligence agencies were more centralized so that there would be one feeder of intelligence that would reach out to all of them. The, the focus of the FBI shifted away from organized crime to terrorism. And then of course, the passage of the Patriot Act, which again, enhanced investigative abilities um, in the United States and abroad. Um, We've heard a lot about the global war on terror. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna go into details about those sorts of things. Although I do wanna point out that, that um, the Bush administration also worked to partner with academics. Um, the Department of Homeland Security um, solicited applications from academic centers in order to, to um, work with them to, to bring research to practice. And so um, on this next slide, I'm just showing you some of the earlier ones. Um, you can see that, that the um, centers of excellence that were um, housed in various universities, uh, coalitions of universities really, um, focused on the economics um, impacts of, of terrorist risks, um, food security. Um, I, um, have been and am a member of the National Consortium of the Study in Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism, which drew on social scientists to, to look at how to address terrorism um, and so forth. The, the current ones, this, is, this isn't meant for you to read, but I wanted to just point out that there are, um, that, that these are continuing today and have continued through several administrations. Now, what I wanna um, talk a little bit about is what our research shows on the effects of government actions relevant to terrorism. Um, through START um, and, and other funding sources, we were able to collect data on what governments have done in response to, um, to the threat of terrorism within their own country. So we looked at Israel, the United Kingdom, um, Lebanon, Egypt, um, the United States, Canada, and so on and so forth. And, and we wanted to collect information on more of the subtle actions that they take, not the big operations, although we include those, but, but really the rhetoric used by government officials um, and things that are more day to day. And so um, it, it's not gonna be surprising that some of these findings really mirror what the earlier panel talked about today. Um, military repression is unlikely to reduce terrorism and it's more likely to exacerbate it when you declare a war, you're gonna to go to war. Um, and, and this is very much the response that, that um, many want when they, when they attack a larger government um, or a larger country. Um, government actions and rhetoric signal how to treat others. Um, so we see a, a um, very dramatic rise in hate crimes that, that, um, you know, that, that mimic the rhetoric of the governments. Um, more popular counterterrorism approaches are not necessarily the most effective. I thought this was really well described today by this melodrama motivated act, melodramatic motivated actions elect leaders. And, but they also contribute to the, to the violence. And so here we have these conflicting demands of, of um, what government should do. Government should reduce, reduce, um, violence and the risk of violence. However, the approaches aren't really aligned with, with what works. Um, also, what we find is that each conflict needs to be understood and addressed according to the understanding of the people involved and the culture involved rather than following a playbook. Um, and then um, probably most importantly is that how terrorist constituencies or the people that the terrorists fight for are treated really matters and responding to grievances and paying attention to the grievances in the community is will will go a long way um, in, in moving things forward now I want to I want to sort of step back and that's what our research shows us but um, as was mentioned by earlier presenters, what we see after 9-11 is this, this growth of anti-outsider -outsi momentum after 9-11. Um, we have this dramatic rise in hate crimes following the 9-11 attacks. Um, this next um, graph is, was generated in a paper by um, Ryan King and some others that show the dramatic spike in anti-Muslim Arab 
hate crime following the 9-11 attacks. And, and while you see a drop, they, they never, it never really does drop down to, to where it, it, should, it was prior to that. Um, we've, the election of Barack Obama intensified this momentum. Um, we had the birther movement that the 2010 Tea Party takeover of Congress really shifted the way that we govern. Um, and then, of course, the Trump campaign and subsequent administration harnessed this momentum to gain political power. And so we see um, mainstream politicians saying, you know, making bizarre claims of that that really fueled the hatred um, of of some of our the people in this country in ways that were that were quite disturbing. Um, so when we combine these research findings with the growing anti outsider momentum, how do we expect terrorism against U.S. interests, U.S. people to evolve? And so I wanted to, I, I just pulled this slide together the, the last couple of days, and I wanted to show you the top 10 perpetrators targeting the U.S. by um, the administration. And so I color coded um, these, so you don't have to look at these. The, the numbers in, in parentheses are the actual number of attacks. Um, and if they're in yellow, those are far right extremists. The green ones are Islamic extremists, and then the gray ones are just others. And what you can see here is that during the Clinton years, the, you know, the, the administration right before the 9-11 attacks, that, that we had terrorist attacks here in the U.S. or against U.S. interests that were mostly motivated by far-right extremists or other interests. Um, and then, not surprisingly, um, with the global war on terror, we see this the growth in green attacks um, with still some yellow. And then under the Obama administration, again, we, we see that the Obama administration and the Bush administrator, administration have a similar distribution, whereas um, under the Donald Trump administration, you see this rise in far right that it's much more dramatic um, and, and even stronger than it was prior to 9-11. To now, um, this may, when we look at this, you may want to ask the question, well, how impactful are these attacks? And so what I wanted to do is show the most fatal perpetrators by administration. And what you can see here are, um, so, so I just show the top five, just in interest of space, and I use the same color coding. And um, under Clinton, you can see that the most, the there was one attack um, that was most fatal, and of course that's Oklahoma City. Um, and then the next two fatal attacks were, were by um, Al Qaeda and, and Saudi Hezbollah. Um, and then um, again, we have um, another, um, white supremacist group or a far right group. Under the Bush administration, the most fatal groups, the, the most fatal groups were all, um, all jihadi. And then under Obama, we had a mixture. Um, and you can see this, this re re recurrence of white supremacy again. And then under the Trump administration, almost all of them were by, by the far right extremists. So what does this mean? Um, and I see that my 10 minutes is up. Um, basically, far right gr groups subsided as the biggest threat after 9-11, but they came back during the Obama years and are, are the biggest threat today. Um, Islamic extremists engaged in an ongoing campaign of violence during military conflicts. When we use the military, we're going to have a military battle. Um, it's not going to work as deterrence, um, you know, which is what the rhetoric claims. And um, most importantly, what the U.S. and other governments do matters. And responses should be strategic and not political. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dugan. Our last presenter is Dr. Alex Thompson, and he will be telling us about the impact of 9-11 on the UN Security Council's authority. Can everyone see my first slide? Thanks. Uh, well, thanks a lot, Holly, and thanks to my fellow panelists for some really amazing um, and rich presentation. So I'm going to go from the, we've gone from the local level to some international, and now I'm really going to go global um, with my little uh, um, presentation on how the uh, UN Security Council, um, how its authority really changed in the years following 9-11 in ways that we're still feeling today. Um, so you may or may not be familiar with the Security Council's powers under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, but they're fairly extraordinary. So the Security Council is supposed to identify threats to international peace and security. And then if it decides to, it can impose enforcement measures, including uh, economic sanctions and things like arms embargoes, uh, all the way up to authorizing the use of force. 
um, against states. And this is really extraordinary in the sort of landscape of international law um, uh, because the Security Council's resolutions are legally binding on states. So this really gives the Security Council a, a unique role um, in international security affairs. Now, traditionally, and I think this is what the framers of the UN Charter had in mind, these Chapter 7 powers were used to respond to specific acts of aggression or specific threats by particular actors and on particular territories. So, for example, you know, following some of North Korea's uh, nuclear tests or ballistic missile tests, the Security Council will pass a resolution under Chapter 7 imposing economic sanctions. So that has happened several times. When uh, Iraq invaded uh, Kuwait in 1990, the Security Council responded with uh, Chapter 7 resolutions, ultimately including a resolution authorizing the use of force. So this was typical for the first um, uh, uh, may get the number right, the first uh, almost 60 years of the Security Council's uh, existence. Then things changed after 9-11. Um, and in particular with Resolution 1373. So this was passed in, on September 28th um, of 2001, passed unanimously in the Security Council. And this was quite different because the Security Council invoked Chapter 7 to impose sweeping obligations on all states to combat terrorism. Um, very different from the more you know, specific uh, uh, uses of Chapter 7 in the past. So states were required to, there, I mean, there are all sorts of obligations in the resolution, you know, to prevent the financing, to disrupt recruitment and movement and not provide safe havens, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also states were instructed to establish domestic laws to punish terrorists. Um, so remember, this is, these are now new legally binding obligations on states. Um, 1373 also established the Counterterrorism uh, Committee within the Security Council to oversee implementation. Um, and then a few years later, created um, the Counterterrorism Executive Directorate to basically provide like secretariat support to the Counterterrorism Committee. Um, and the CTED can also go into countries to um, basically uh, monitor their implementation of 1373 and also provide them with technical assistance um, and other help to get them up to speed on implementing 1373. So we have sweeping obligations and a new institutional structure um, in the area of terrorism. A few years later, uh, in 2004, the Security Council passes Resolution 1540, again invoking Chapter 7, and again imposing obligations across the board on all states related to weapons of mass destruction. Um, and that was the, the terminology used also. Um, and so states were required to prevent non-state actors from acquiring WMD. They were also required to adopt national legislation to uh, uh, help prevent the spread of WMD to non-state actors. And they were required to submit national reports. So quite a structure here of, of implementation and uh, monitoring. And I should say it's very unusual for the Security Council to be telling states, sovereign states that they have to adopt national legislation, right? That would normally be considered kind of a no-no in the, in the UN system with sovereign states. Also establishes a committee, the 1540 Committee, it gets support from the, the Office of Disarmament and the, and the Secretariat of the UN and a group of experts. Um, and one thing I want to note is that this isn't just a general sort of non-proliferation uh, resolution. It's specifically focused on the, that risk that WMD would get in the hands of terrorists, right? That nexus of WMD and terrorism that was such a prominent part of the, the Bush doctrine and the and sort of U.S. Uh, policy following 9-11. So you can definitely see kind of the stamp of the interests of the United States um, on this resolution. Okay, so why am I so obsessed with resolution 1373 and resolution 1540? Um, this is my last uh, slide. So, uh, you know, the way I view this is that is that the members of the Security Council, especially the Permanent Five, were really using the sort of environment post 9-11, which we can all remember, 
uh, as a, an opportunity to expand the Security Council's authority. So with these resolutions, the Security Council was imposing open-ended legal obligations on, on issues, in this case, the issues being terrorism and WMB proliferation, not on any specific threats, actors, or territory. And they're also creating new institutional structures to implement all of this. So normally, the, the, you know, we, we have processes for creating new international law. And in some ways, what the Security Council is doing here is bypassing those normal processes of uh, states consent negotiating and consenting to say new treaties or to create new international organizations. And instead the Security Council is just doing this on its own using its sort of unique power to create legally binding obligations on states. In other words, some people would say that the Security Council is basically acting as a global legislature um, to uh, bypass the normal processes of state consent. Um, and another implication which uh, you know, I won't really have time to go into, but by creating these very broad obligations without, by the way, defining what terrorism is or what a terrorist group uh, uh, um, um, is, gave governments around the world and has continued to give governments around the world this sort of multilateral cover to pursue a really wide range of counterterrorism policies, some of which are quite legitimate, but others, uh, um, um, might be uh, borderline in that regard. And now they have, of course, Security Council resolutions. They can say they're just complying with their obligations under international law. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. And thank you, everyone. Thank you to the esteemed panelists for joining us today. Thank all of you for being here. There is now a break. We want to be sure to preserve the break since we realized that 11 to 4 is a long time to be on Zoom. So there's a break now until 2.40. And at that point in time, there will be a panel on the legal legacy of 9-11. So we'll see you all back, hopefully, in about nine minutes.